Hello, my name is Ted Helms. Welcome to the first video of many showing my acrylic painting process and techniques. This painting is called The Gardener and I hope you enjoy it. The first thing I do for every painting is cover my transfer drawing with a thin brown wash. It's a good way to get some color on the canvas and it creates a base layer which provides texture and color that can bleed through future layers making them more interesting. Once the brown wash is down I start a second layer to add in the rough color base for the entire painting. I start with the concrete pad, fence, and ground. I use black to indicate a plastic flower pot behind her hand, some of the ground nearby, and for the shadow color of her garden trowel. Continuing to add base colors, I use black on the cracks between the rocks and the wall, add some darker areas to the ground, and then add some gray to her garden fork. Her wings are next, and I use black as the base color for her wing frame. I use light blue to block inner skin area and tint it with black to add some shadows. The intention is to create a dark fairy with bluish skin, so putting a blue tinted layer down early will give further transparent layers a bluish hue. Putting the colors down now also helps to remind me where her skin sections are since they can get covered up as the painting progresses. I use the same light blue for her wing sections. I use a thicker black for the dark shadows and creases of her overalls. The other areas receive a thin black wash to block them in. I had an idea that her hair was going to be dark brown or black. So I treated it like her overalls, using a thicker black where the shadows would be and a thinner wash everywhere else. Next I added crease line to her right sleeve, blocked in her undershirt, then worked on her left sleeve inside. I added in a few other base color bits including the stick holding her hair up, darkening her eyes and lips, and adding some deeper shadow areas into her hair. The rock wall is next. I mixed most of my colors by hand and used a couple of gray shades for the gray rocks and shades of yellow ochre mixed with brown to create the base rock color along with the dark areas on the rock face. I like mixing the colors myself because as I add new layers, the new shades add texture to the areas being covered, making them more interesting in my opinion. A lot of painters say paint dark to light and I tend to agree with that on an object basis. However, from a painting basis I paint from furthest to closest object because as I add closer objects they overlap those behind them and it helps to create a cohesive scene. In this case the fence and rock wall are the furthest objects so I start working on the fence using a light beige wash made from mixing brown and white. I try to avoid painting where the fence slats are pushed together so the brown undercolor becomes the gap shadow between slats. The brown undercolor also shows through the beige layer helping to sell the idea that the wood slats aren't a solid color, which tends to make them look more cartoony. I create a dark gray color and add some knot holes to the fence trying to create some interesting features. Then I dirty up the wood with a gray wash to distress it, breaking up the beige color even more. After that I darken the gaps emphasizing the cracks between the slats. To finish the fence I darken up the knot holes, touch up the beige layer in some areas, and distress the wood even more in others. This adds more texture and interest to the wood. For the rock wall, I use a light yellow ochre color to brighten up some of the rock faces. Then create some shadowed areas using a gray tone. Next, I add a variety of yellow ochre splotches to create the rock's texture. I add another layer of light yellow ochre to push the texture back. Then, I add some nearly white highlights indicating where the sun's hitting. Follow that up by adding a darker yellow layer to break up the light yellow layer I put down earlier. Then I add in some black to give the rock some depth and use a black wash to deepen the shadows on the rock faces. 
Lastly, I touch up some areas with the light yellow ochre color. From there, I spotted an area of her overalls I missed earlier and took the opportunity to add some color to it. Then I used the light yellow ochre color as the base color for her shirt. Moving back to the rocks, I start working on the next batch using the same techniques as earlier. Essentially, I'm making a semi-transparent sandwich. I put down the base color layer, put in a detail layer, then cover the details with another color layer, and add highlights and shadow washes where needed, being sure to blend them in with the top color layer. Looking at the rocks, you can see the under layers through the successive layers, and each one adds more and more texture, helping to build the realism. I'm using a photo reference to help define the textures and place shadows and highlights. I try to follow my reference as closely as possible, but this process naturally creates unique textures, and when I start adding highlights and shadows, they can vary greatly from the photo. So it's important to have a good understanding of where the light sources are and what highlights and shadows would be created by the textures I end up with. I think the rocks end up looking pretty good and the technique achieves the level of realism I'm looking for. It takes about an hour and a half for me to finish painting the yellow rocks. Then I start working on the gray ones. These rocks get the same treatment as the yellow ones, except with gray. While painting the rocks, I end up covering her wingtips, so I use black to add them back in and work to finish the rock details. This painting was interesting in that I don't usually put as much time into the background as I do the foreground, but in this case the background was quite close and I felt it needed to be treated with more detail. Thanks for sticking with me through the rocks. We'll be moving on to the garden area soon, but first, I need to add another layer to the concrete slab. Now, this is a dark fairy who likes her bling, so I decided she was wearing silver gardening gloves and boots. In the past, I used shades of gray to mimic silver. However, I recently purchased silver metallic paint and wanted to try it. As I applied the silver paint, it was obvious it was too transparent to use as a base color layer. That was disappointing, but I do find a solution that works out well. I also purchased some neon paint and this was a great opportunity to use it. Unfortunately, it had the same issue as the silver paint and fortunately had a similar solution. I move on to add another light blue color layer on her wings and skin. These are areas I'm not interested in having the brown wash show through, so I want them to be thicker.
on we go to her garden. The first thing we do is paint over the rocks we just spent so much time on. All right, not all of them, but some of them. I think it's important to fully add background details in any area where an object's edges may exist. For the object to appear in the same space as the background, there should be a clean change between it and the background with no gaps between them. The garden plants have lots of edges, so to keep the realism I needed to make sure the rock wall extended well below my expected plant line. For the first pass on the garden I used a dark green wash of hooker green where the bulk of the plants are going to live. I was a little sloppy with this layer since the garden is organic and other layers will cover most of it. Then I start blocking out basic plant shapes using the hooker green undiluted for the shadows and mixed with various amounts of cadmium yellow medium to get different shades of green. I place some taller plant stems behind her wing, in front of the fence, and under her arm to add interest. Then go back to using my liner brush to better define the shadows. After that, I apply some midtones and finally the highlights which have white added. Instead of applying the same color to all areas of the painting where that particular color should go, I like to work in defined areas, like the section behind her, then move on to another section, like the one under her arm, and then finally to the area by the fence. Psychologically, it gives me a sense of progress and accomplishment which keeps me excited about finishing the painting. I had another coat of the silver paint to her boots and gloves in the hopes that it would help. It did, but I could still see through both layers of the silver. And while I like transparent layers, seeing brown through the silver one doesn't work for me. Back to the garden. Dead leaves have fallen from nearby trees, so I rough in a mid-tone tan color. Then darken the ground in the areas where there's no garden cover and add in even more dead leaves to both the ground and concrete slab. There's an empty black flower pot next to her hand and I work on it using a black gray palette. Then I decide her overalls need another black wash and I rough in her eyebrows and add shadows to her face. I also give some of the leaves shadows. My solution for the silver and neon paint ends up being to paint a base layer using a similar non-transparent color, then paint the silver metallic and neon colors over them. I start by painting her boots and gloves gray. After that minor diversion, I move back to the garden plants. I realize that the underlayer near the fence isn't nearly dark enough and put down more of the straight hooker green. Then go in with the mid-tones to create the larger plant leaf shapes. Add some more long stem plants and put some flowers on them. I work on the little brown plant near the garden fork and add yellow highlights to the dead leaves with my liner brush. The highlights were a mix of yellow ochre and white.
Well, the garden's finally done, so I start working on her wings next since they're the objects furthest back. I had already decided that her wings were going to be blue and black, a classic color combination for a dark fairy. I used a slightly lightened ultramarine blue instead of the white that was tinted with ultramarine blue I originally put down for the base color layer. I thought the darker blue would stand out better against the background than the light blue. This is the point where I started feeling her wings were too small, and while it is a fantasy painting and there really aren't any rules, I felt her wings needed to be bigger. I end up deciding that while her wings probably should have been quite a bit bigger, I wanted to keep them completely on the canvas, so in the end I compromised to maintain the image's composition. This change speaks to a couple of things. First, if you're using sketches, sometimes what looks okay for the sketch won't for the final painting. Second, don't be afraid to make changes that you feel will make the painting better. You may be right or you may be wrong, but at the time you make the best decision you can. Hopefully, over time, you'll make more right decisions than wrong ones. Off camera, I sketched the wing extensions onto the painting. Because of the architecture of the wings, the extensions won't fully cover up the smaller wing. This means I have to cover some parts of the wing with rock texture, which brings me to color matching. Since I use multiple layers of different colors, it's actually pretty easy to come up with a color that's close because it doesn't have to be an exact match. I mix it as close as I can and if it's off, that's okay because it looks like a blemish or shadow or some other distress mark. Another way to sell the new color is to dab it onto other unaffected parts of the object. Those color splashes make it look like the reworked portion belongs to the object. We'll see more of this idea as I continue working with the concrete slab. I use the liner brush to extend her wing spikes and the larger brush to fill in the colored wing sections. My youngest son suggested putting white dots on the wings like some butterflies have. Initially I didn't want the wings to look like butterflies since that seemed ordinary to me, but after thinking about it I decided it was probably a good idea. I used Google Images to look up some reference photos and that led me to one that not only had white dots but a blue color gradient. I decided to use both the dots and the color gradient to add further interest to her wings. I used Blue Purple 75 by Liquitex to create the gradient using white to lighten it for the top sections and straight from the tube for the bottom ones. This color gives a nice luminescence to the painting. I add another black layer to the wing structure and then add the white dots to the outer branches to finish her wings off. Along the idea of painting back to front, I also try painting bottom to top. With this painting, the bottom objects are the dirt and concrete pad, then the fairy, leaves, and garden trowel sitting on the pad. But between them and the pad is their shadows, so that's what I start working on next. Shadow colors and darkness levels can be challenging. My general approach is to mix the color of the underlying object with black and use that as the base of the shadow. However, I've also had success applying a straight black wash since the color below shows through, essentially achieving the same effect. As an example, I use a black wash for the shadow under the fairy, making it darker by adding more wash layers or thicker ones until I get the shadow to the darkness I'm looking for. The color of the concrete and leaves show through the layers, giving the shadows their color. I start working on the shadows under the leaves again. Then I decided her silver boots needed some separation between them and the concrete pad, so I give them black soles. Now back to the leaves. Originally, I used a darker shade of brown for the shadows, but now I'm using that black wash to darken in some areas. 
I think the trick is to make sure there is an appropriate amount of darkness and color variety to keep the viewer's interest, or at least not set off their this looks wrong alarm. I lay in some shadows around the garden fork to help give it some shape. Then over to the trowel and gloves adding more shadows. I decide to work on the trowel and fork some more by adding highlights. While I do have to think about where the light source is, I'm able to shortcut that process quite a bit by using my photo reference, which has the lighting issues already worked out. If you don't have a good photo reference available, you can mimic the lighting source by using a light source and an object of similar material and shape to see where the shadows and highlights are. Once you've done a hundred or so paintings of similar objects under various light sources, you'll probably be able to make up the shadows and highlights based on your experience. But I'm not close to that yet, so I could be wrong, and you might still need a reference. The fork tines needed some more work, as well as the plastic flower pot behind it. I go over the yellow areas on the garden tools handles again, then back to work on the leaves. Now we start to get to the really interesting part of the painting, the fairy herself. This image is particularly challenging since so many sections are both in back of something and in front of something. With an image like this, you just pick a section and go for it. In this case, I decided her skin was below more sections than it was above, so it was next. I decided I wanted blue skin instead of pink with a blue tint, so I mixed a little ultramarine blue with white, which was the original base color, and added another layer of the blue to her skin. I tint the light blue with black and used that for the shadow color on her face and chest. I used washes of different shades of blue to blend the shadows with her skin. The shadows on her chest proved to be quite challenging for me to get right. I find it can really help to move on from something difficult and come back to it later, looking at it with fresh eyes can sometimes help make it less difficult. So I got her chest to a point where I was okay with it, and then moved on to adding shadows to her boots. I used black and gray washes to create the shadows and blend them with the gray mid-tone color. For the shadows on her forearms, I used the same dark tinted light blue as I did for her face and chest. Because her skin is light blue, I actually use a straight white wash for the highlights on her forearm and face. I use the base light blue color wash over the white and darker tinted light blue to blend them together. One of the trade-offs for using washes is that if they are too watery, the paint will leave rings of color when it dries. This is okay because you have the opportunity to redistribute that color with your brush while it's still damp. I use the brush as mini sandpaper and rub the bristles through the color ridge back and forth to push it around, blending it with the surrounding color. Using this technique, I can push the paint where I want and create pretty smooth blends. I already had black ready from shading her arms, so I decided to do some work on her hair. I know this breaks the rule about painting back to front since her hair is really the most front part of this painting, but this is the point that I decided her hair's base color needed to be much darker. I add highlights to areas of her black overalls using light gray. I know, they look an awful lot like they're actually gray, but just you wait, I've got a plan. I bounce over to her shirt and, mixing white and yellow ochre to make a cream color, paint her right sleeve, skipping the darker crease areas I added earlier. Then I work on her left sleeve and side. There's a thin part of her shirt that crosses her chest, so I work on that, then adjust the shadowed area between her back and her overalls, and add in some shadows in front of her left armpit. So, this is a fairy with wings, right? But she's got a shirt on. Hmm, how'd the wings get through her shirt? Well, I figured her shirts must have a large opening in the back of them for her wings to fit through. From this perspective, you can see some of her exposed back skin through those openings. 
That's what I'm painting on her back between her shirt and overalls. After painting her back, I work on the creases in her shirt some more. Like her wings, I decided her gloves and boots needed a change. Even though they were silver, they needed something more. After looking up some references of gothic gloves and boots, I sketched in some more interesting features. I added ribbon ties to her gloves and buckle straps to her boots. I think the boots turned out better than the gloves, but I ended up being happy that I made the changes to both. I used the liner brush to add in shadows and create the ribbon ties on her left hand glove. I also add to the shadow made by her arm on the concrete to take away some of the glove volume, slimming it down a bit. Next, I use black to add shadows to her boot straps. There's one strap on her right boot and then all the buckles on her left one. After dropping in the dark shadows, I use light gray to highlight the metal buckles and a slightly darker gray for the straps. Her left boot had an interesting perspective challenge because I couldn't find any good photo references of a boot like this in this position and I wasn't sure which parts and how much of the front of the boot you would see when kneeling like this. Fortunately, we had a lace-up boot that I was able to bend into the position and see exactly how it should look. The lesson is, if you're trying to figure out a perspective issue and can't find a photo reference, maybe there's something in your house you can use as a substitute. Working on her right glove, I add highlights, blending them with the mid-tones using gray washes. As part of adjusting the shadows under her fingers, I had to try and color match to the concrete pad. I was close, but you could tell it wasn't the exact color. So I used the color splash technique I mentioned earlier. I layered the color I mixed randomly around the nearby area, making it look like it was a natural color difference occurring elsewhere on the pad. I think using this idea, the color mismatch can create interesting textures instead of something that seems out of place. I work on the left glove continuing to adjust the shadows, then move over to the trowel doing the same. One of the last adjustments on the trowel is to cover some of the shadow up with the concrete pad gray. This leads me to clean up a few other nearby areas. Now is the time to test my solution for the silver paint. I start applying it over the gray. Well, it ends up working, but as it turns out, it's not quite as simple as just putting a silver glaze over the gray. In addition to the base silver, I have to also mix dark and light tints then blend the three tones together like I did with the gray. It's okay, but it seems like a lot more work for the effect than I was hoping for. Maybe future efforts will produce better results. By the way, don't get me wrong, it is really cool to tilt the final painting and see the silver sparkle, but for prints or digital images, it really doesn't come across. So if that's your goal, it's probably not worth it. After adding silver paint to the garden tools, I start working on her boots. I use the same techniques as I did on her glove, but her boots have a much more complex shadow pattern because of her body position.
Her shirt is next. I start by enhancing the crease shadows, which are a mix of the cream color, which is light and yellow ochre and black. Then I use the straight cream color to layer over some of the shadows to lighten them to the level I want. I block in the buckles on her overall strap and then add highlights to her shirt. Since the shirt is cream, I use straight white for the highlight color. It's not quite right, but it seems to work okay. If you think about the sunlight hitting her shirt, a yellowish light, the shirt's highlight color shouldn't be much different from its actual color, so a white wash allows some of the cream color to show through and ends up being enough of a difference that it reads properly to your eye. I use the same highlight color to lighten up areas on her shoulder and back. Then move to add shadows to the front of her shoulder and armpit area. It ends up that there's a lot going on with clothing folds. Essentially a fold is a dark and a light area blended together. So if you have a bunch of these, as with her sleeve, you have a lot of blending work to do. Then, of course, the shadows will usually be darker in areas of deeper folds and lighter in shallow ones. So you have to make decisions based on that. If all the folds have the same shadow value, the object can look mechanical or structured. So your shadow value decisions play a major role in how the object is perceived by the viewer. With her shirt being organic, I wanted to make sure the fold shadow values were quite varied. After working on her shirt, I move on to her overalls and work on her strap and the bib hanging down. Using a photo reference can be both good and bad. It can help you quite a bit with lighting issues, such as with the folds and general proportions. However, if you're also using it to show how objects obstruct other objects, it can add to your work if you ignored it or maybe didn't pay very close attention early on. In this case, after looking at my reference, I noticed that there was a gap between where the overall strap ended and the top of the bib started. This gap showed her skin beneath the strap clip, so I had to make a choice. Do I ignore the reference and make the strap obscure chest, or do I make the adjustment? Well, I guess my detailed obsession kicked in because I decided I had to make it look right, even though most people wouldn't even have noticed. I paint over the strap with her light blue chest color and repaint the buckle using yellow ochre. Adjust her black shirt, and then add in the buckle clip over the area I just painted. I also added in some highlights and shadows to the metal buckle pieces themselves. Then I work on the shadowed area in front of her bib using black and gray washes. I start adding my neon yellow to the garden tool handles. I was able to apply the neon yellow straight to the handles because the area was so small. I didn't have to mix and blend multiple shades like I did with the silver. It worked out well and the yellow underlayer supported the neon layer nicely. I finish up with the garden tools then do a little touch up work to thin out the cream shirt covering her chest. The shirt line was too thick for me so I painted in more of the background to make it thinner. After that short detour I worked to block in shades of gray on her black overalls. I know they look even less black now but don't you worry I've still got a plan. While I don't feel I'm very good at blending colors using the more traditional methods, I think I did okay with the overall pants, using gray washes to blend between the colors. Doing this, I can push the paint where I want, then let it dry and use my brush to rub off paint where I don't want it. This gives a feathered effect along the edge, and I think it blends the colors well. Let me know what you think in the comments.
I add some subtle details to the overall fabric lifting off her back and then add highlights and shadows to her hip area. This is probably the most complicated area of this image with all the folds, loops, and buttons. I'm relying very heavily on my photo reference here. At last, I'll reveal my plan to turn not black overalls into black ones. Washes. Yeah, that's it. I put a few layers of thin black paint over the areas I've already shaded, and all of a sudden, she's wearing black overalls. Who knew? Alright, I've already done this on the wings and to some extent on her chest, so you might have guessed. But this is probably the most dramatic example of the technique on this painting. Hopefully this shows a useful way to use washes. I add some more color to her shirt, working to get the lighting right on it. I work on her wrists, darkening the shadows of her left shirt cuff and forearm. Then I darken some of the fold shadows on her sleeves and side. I decide the dark shadows on her pants aren't enough, so I add more black to them. I use the black to darken the shadows in her hair, then I create two yellow highlight areas across the top of her head, and then add in some medium brown to break her hair up. From her hair, it's back to the shadows on her chest and working to make both the lighting and blending better. The shadows still aren't quite right, but I move on to her face. For scenes with characters, their face is usually the most important part of the image and right now she seems a bit plain. So I accentuate her features by darkening them using black and ultramarine blue. I go back to working the shadows on her chest, blending the colors more. I make some minor adjustments to her eyes and mouth and then back to her chest. In addition to blending the shadows, I also work to clean up her black shirt. I add white highlights to her nose and around her eye, then darken the area around her nose and blend it into her cheeks. I darken her mouth and the shadows under her nose, and then I darken her eyelids and the area under her cheekbones. Along the way, I decided her hair needed to be blue, so I started adding in some dark blue streaks to break her hair up. I add light blue highlights and use a mid-tone blue to blend the light and dark areas. Then I add a yellow wash over the highlighted areas for the sunlight hitting her hair. This does give it a slight green tint, and I'm pretty sure blue hair doesn't read as green in sunlight, but it ended up looking okay. I follow that up by adding white, slightly tinted with blue, to push up the highlights in a few select areas. Then I blend it together with a blue wash and add some more mid-tone blues to further break up some of the darker areas. Now we're in the home stretch. I do some more cleanup work on her face, chest, and neck. I decided her black shirt was a touch too high and lowered it a bit, all while still trying to get the shadows right. After changing the shirt line, I work on her nose and eyes for a while. I'm widening her nose a little and adding some shadows to her eyes. Then I touch up a few other areas around her face.
I'm not happy with the blending between the dark black portion of her pants and the lighter area next to it, so I blend them together using a dark gray wash. I do a little more touch up work in a few other shadow areas including one last adjustment to the shadows around her neck and she's done. Thanks for watching the video, I appreciate it and since you stuck around, here's some more information. The gardener was painted on an 8 by 8 inch canvas board and took approximately 30 hours to finish. Besides the large brush used to apply the initial brown wash, I used a 3-0 round brush for the larger areas and a liner brush for the fine details. The final image was scanned using a flip pal scanner and I used GIMP to make some minor corrections from scanning. After scanning I coated the painting with a glossy varnish to seal it. I recorded almost every brush stroke however there was another hour or two spent cleaning up minor details off camera. Lastly, if you'd like a print of this painting they are available along with many other themed gifts in our store. The link is in the description along with our other social media sites. Hey everyone, this was our first video and I'd love to hear your feedback. We'll be working to improve the video quality, but while we're working on that, please let us know if there's anything else we can do to make our next one even better. Whatever feedback you have, we'd love to hear it. So leave your comments below. Also, if you liked the video, click the like button. And if you'd like to be notified when we release future videos, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks again, and we hope you have a fantastic day.